Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good morning and aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My name is Mark Shklov and I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Today my Law Across the Sea program is titled Beyond the Great Wall. And my guests are Larry Foster and Russell Liu. Both Larry and Russell have lived and worked and traveled in the People's Republic of China for many years while also maintaining their personal and professional ties to Hawaii. Both are lawyers. Larry is the former dean of William S. Richardson School of Law, where he still teaches law. Russell practices law in Hawaii and the US. In 2007, both Larry and Russell were living and working in the People's Republic of China, and we collaborated on an article titled Behind the Great Wall which appeared in the Hawaii Bar Journal. China was mysterious and developing at that time. In our article for the Hawaii Bar Journal, we discussed Larry's and Russell's personal and professional lives in China, what it's like to be a foreigner and lawyer living and working in China, the relationships between the people of the United States and China, Hawaii's role in those relationships and China's future. More than 10 years later, we've got together again to continue that discussion. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you both. Thank welcome. You. Glad to be here, Mark. Here's the uh, Hawaii Bar Journal article, or the, the book that contained the article. You guys look the same <laughs> 10 years later. Uh, what has changed in your lives? What, what, Larry, what, what has changed with respect to China in your lives? Where are you now with China? Uh, well, I have, a, if you will, a different relationship with China now. I'm no longer living there. My wife and I lived in, in, in China until 2013 uh, when we moved back to Hawaii. In Shanghai is where in, you in, live in, now. In Shanghai. And then uh, still go back at least once a year to, uh, uh, to China to see friends and uh, do some activities there. And any work in China or with respect to China? Yeah, so the, the work I'm doing now in, in China, uh, most recently, just, just actually the, the last year and a half or so, I've been doing training programs in China for uh, Chinese lawyers. Uh, uh, I do a day-long program on legal reasoning and writing and a day-long program on fundamentals of contract drafting. Okay, Russell, what about you? Um, well, I'm still in China, and I'm, it's 15 years going strong. As you know, I live there most of the time, full time. Um, I teach law, but I also uh, work in Beijing, in Beijing, yeah. and, and practice law. And I actually um, are doing more work for Chinese clients that are going outbound, outside, making investments around the world. Um, and I see that that's a, an area that's growing. I'm also seeing that with the middle class in China, there's new opportunities for American lawyers, uh, entertainment, media law, which I'm getting involved into. And now I'm affiliated with the law firm with their office in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. What, what's the law firm? It's called Kingsfield Law. And okay. um, the lawyers are actually um, really not, in a sense, all of us have a global uh, perspective and experiences around the world. So okay. um, it's, it's a very niche in that area in, so in technology. You still, still practice and you still live in, a lot of t your time still in China. Still practice and live in China. And, and, mm -hmm. and the reason why is you have to be there if you're going to still practice the mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. The culture is still a mystery at many times. Uh, you know, learning the culture. It's a thousand, thousand year old culture. And it, it's, it's so important for me to be there. Okay. Now, in the 10 years since we collaborated on that article, you, you were in Shanghai, that's your base, Beijing. Okay, Larry, what ha what's changed in, in, in the Shanghai and, and the China? And I'll ask you the same, same question about Beijing and China in a minute. Yeah, I'll start off primarily with uh, Shanghai. Uh, one of the things that, that marks China is uh, rapid change. So the, the uh, Shanghai, well, let me back up a bit. My wife and I have been going to China, or 
to, to mainland China. Um, uh, but myself since the early 80s, my wife in 1978. Uh, so we've seen dramatic changes in China o over the decades. But just in the time that we were in, in Shanghai, uh, I think we moved out there in around 2006, came back in 2013, uh, roughly an eight year period, uh, dramatic changes in Shanghai. Uh, one example on the infrastructure, when we arrived in Shanghai, the, uh, uh, they were just opening the, the second subway line, line number two. Uh, by the time we left, they were constructing lines 17, 18, and 19. Wow. Uh, so just amazing infrastructure. Mm. Um, um, uh, the the uh, uh, new buildings, office towers, condominiums, all of this stuff, uh, uh, high-speed rail, uh, just astonishing infrastructure projects taking place in China. And has that continued till today, or is it, uh, or is it slowing it, down? It, or it, is it, it, it really continues. They've uh, um, the uh, uh, all uh, you know, the all the major cities in in, in uh, China are uh, big on infrastructure projects, primarily funded through the uh, national government. Uh, but you know, subways, the the linking up of the country by by high speed rail is uh, astonishing. Uh, it used to be you could take a Overnight train from Shanghai to Beijing, it would take uh, nine, ten hours. Now it's four and a half hours mm. uh, uh, to do. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's just it's amazing the yeah. The, and the and my my own uh, thought was all the architectural changes <laughs> in in Shanghai, uh, especially across the river. Yes, uh, where they're they're just building. Uh, tremendous towers and that, that that type of thing. Russell, Beijing, what, think, what's the cha changes are the same or same growth? What's, what's going I, on? I think like I, I echo Larry's comments because the changes in Beijing are still astounding. Um, I'm seeing a, a Beijing proper really expanding. Um, some of the rural areas now are part of the city. Um, and it, when I was first there, they had two or three lines. Now we've got like 20 lines. It's the largest subway in the world. Beijing has overtaken New York and many other places. Really? It's the largest subway. And they're building also subways that are extending up because Beijing is actually the land size is, is expanding because of uh, the Olympics, Summer Olympics in a few years. So they're moving a lot of businesses outward from the city. And people uh, are moving outward because the, the subways are fantastic. Um, for example, um, when I first arrived there, they had the three-ring row. Now they're up to six, seven. Um, and the travel time, if you took a bus from the third-ring road where I used to live to the other side of town would take you two and a half, three hours. So that, that's within the metropolitan area? It's within the metropolitan area. Of what's area. called Beijing. Beijing. Right? And so the old that's metropolitan it. area. So now that only takes me about 40 minutes by subway. Mm. And, uh, it, and so a lot of changes to the infrastructure. Okay, so what I'm hearing is... Things haven't changed in the development. Things are still progressing. Is that true for China in in general? Both bo both of you? Oh yes, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, across the country. And in fact, I, I'm waiting to catch the high speed train. They're supposed to do a linkage from Beijing to go to all of Hong Kong. Uh, there, there, there's a new route that's supposed to take from Beijing and New York, and doesn't stop at the border. The border is going to come out in Hong Kong. That's where you exit the Chinese authorities. Okay, so so the economic development, the building, the construction, uh, architecture, that type of thing, it's still going strong. Ten years after we first talked about it, and uh, at that time, I think Larry, in, in our article, you were talking about the um, uh, the optimism and the positive nature and the dynamic nature of the Chinese and being in China, do you still feel the same way when you go back there or, or when, when you live there? Yeah, things have slowed down a little bit, at least in Shanghai. I'm not sure about uh, Beijing. Uh, uh, part of it has to do with uh, 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 the government there in, in China. Part of it has to do with there, there's just much less foreign direct investment coming into China. Uh, it was the foreign direct investment that, that drove all of this this amazing growth in, 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 in China. And uh, that has, has slowed down a great deal. Uh, so now the, the projects you see are, are you know, uh, the result of more 
if you will, uh, internal funding as opposed to uh, a foreign direct investment. Hmm. So that is a change. Yes. That's different. Yes. Okay, that, that's a good point. Okay, Russell. Sure, and I, I, I echo that what Larry's talking about because China made a conscious change. Um, they changed from an economy with low-end manufacturing. Now they're looking to move up the value chain, the supply chain, so it's higher-end technology. So I see it in Beijing, uh, the Silicon Valley, is Zheng Wansun, I see a lot of startup companies. A lot of technology is used by everyday people. Like, for example, WeChat. And you pay your money using your, your, your phones. You don't carry cash. I, never, I carry maybe 200 RMB just in case, I never use it. Everything I do is real time. So as I recall, China was all cash when, when I was there. Yes. So that, that, that's a change. That's yeah, a, now, yeah, now it's all uh, uh, phone. And, and it's tremendous because it, it has brought, I think, a lot of good things to parts of China that would not experience that. For example, if you're in uh, Xinjiang, which is the far northwest, you want to buy something, you can get on the, um, your smartphone, you can get on uh, Alibaba's site, and you can order something, and through WeChat, Alipay, you pay it, and because of the development of the logistical system in China, <laughs> high-speed rail, you'll get it in the next day or two. So it's, wow. it's, it's brought prosperity, I believe, to places other than Beijing. Okay, um, and that's pretty common within the populace, would you say, or is it, are we only talking within the cities, or is this No, th throughout China. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the use of e-commerce is, is some, or we, the use of mobile phones is something that sets China apart. In the United States, we, you know, we went through you know, hardline phones and then slowly get into cell phones and stuff like that. Uh, China today, the last figure I saw was almost 900 million internet users yes. wow. in, in, in China. Uh, uh, so that's way more than half the population uh, mm -hmm. are, are, are you know, using their, using their, their, their phones uh, as cash to, uh, to, to purchase uh, items online. E-commerce e is, is huge in China. And just to add to that, for example, <clears throat> the biggest day in China, is put up by Alibaba, the retail uh, e-commerce. It's called uh, November 11th, 11, 11, 11, Singles Day. And on that day, in 24-hour period, everything is done through e-commerce uh, and to their site. And they raked in last year uh, $25.3 billion in that 24-hour period, more than uh, Amazon and eBay could do in a year. So it's tremendous e-commerce. So as you can see, the changes in society, the everyday people have changed. Okay. Um, now, I, I, I want to ask you one thing that maybe, I'm not sure if it has changed. How about the air pollution? I mean, when I was there with Larry 10 years ago, he, I think you had a, some sort of an app or something that could mm -hmm. tell you what the air pollution was. Air quality. Uh, air I'm quality. sorry. Uh, please excuse me. AQI. Air quality, yeah. AQI. Air quality index. <laughs> yes. What, China talked a lot about curing that. What's happened? So they've actually made some improvements on that, and, and this has been, <clears throat> there have been a number of studies that, that have been done on that. Uh, and it's an ongoing process. It's hugely expensive, as we know in the U.S., uh, 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 to do this. Uh, but uh, uh, by and large, the, the air quality is getting better now every every in, in Shanghai every, Shanghai Beijing a lot of other a lot of other places and I'll talk about Beijing well, yeah talk, I had to because everybody's everybody you know, talks about Beijing, Beijing yeah. it's notorious for you know um, to the credit really mm -hmm. of the Chinese government it has changed it's gotten better and um, a couple five years ago I went to an event Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles came out and Jerry Brown and they're selling the technology to the Chinese for, the for air quality, air quality okay. and doing startup joint ventures. And it's, it's amazing because last year, 2017 in October, it was the last coal burning plant in the city that was closed down. And they have a program with huge fines. They actually do inspections. And I live in Beijing, and I'll tell you, it's the first time in all these years I noticed a change. In the winter, it's usually the worst time when the pollution would settle in. Um, there were so many great days, skies are blue, you didn't have pollution. But I still carry my mask around just in case. But I think over time, I think it's getting better and better. The city is actually yeah. expanding out. Okay. It, so. It's getting better, but uh, environmental issues are still the, the number one concern 
of uh, the people in China. Okay, um, so, so they, they are paying attention to it and oh, trying to very, do so. very, very much so. Okay, and when we come back from our break, I want to ask a little bit more about what lives are like for the people there, if you've been able to notice any changes. So we're going to take a short break and then we'll come right back. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. We are back with Larry Foster, Russell Liu, and we are going beyond the Great Wall and talking about what's happened in the past 10 years since our first collaboration on a Hawaii Bar article concerning China. Gentlemen, all right, we are back. What's life like? What is life like first for Chinese? Has it changed in the past 10 years of things? How are things? Larry. Yeah, uh, so life of the Chinese, well, the, uh, um, <coughs> I can't remember when this ended, but they, they, they uh, uh, essentially brought 300 million people out of poverty and created a middle class. And now the, the plan is to bring another 300 million people out of poverty. So with the biggest change in China, uh, and it started while we were there, was the, the development of a middle class in, in, in China. That's important for an internal um, uh, economy. Uh, you can't rely totally on foreign direct investment. Uh, so the, and that's intentional. That's right? intentional. So uh, they've been very successful on, on, on that side. There's some concern whether or not they can maintain it with the decline in foreign direct investment. Uh, there, mm. There's been some, some concern about that. Uh, so the day-to-day the -day lives of the people are pretty good. Uh, the, um, the, there are some major concerns by, by the people, if you will. And one of those is, is uh, I'll call it a, a, a government uh, uh, clampdown on, on what we would consider basic civil liberties. Mm. Um, so uh, that is a, a, a growing concern to, to people in China. Uh, the internet is getting harder and harder to access. Uh, uh, the uh, speeds are much, much slower on, on internet these days. Uh, the uh, government censorship has, has increased. Uh, um, Russell maybe can talk about the university side a little bit, that um, universities are uh, uh, told to uh, uh, stop doing all this Western stuff, uh, look inward, don't look outward. Uh, mm -hmm. Corporations now have to have um, uh, uh, party members on their board of directors uh, to make decisions that are more party-centered than business-centered. Um, so there's some disturbing things that are, that are taking place right now in China. And, and that bothers Chinese as well. Oh, absolutely. You've talked to, and, and so absolutely. I see it sounds like economics may have improved, but there is a governmental side that says, hey, uh, we're going to be a little stricter. R Russell, is, have you? I, I, can add, I can add to that, actually, but, you know, because I'm there mostly full time, um, and I, I'm, I'm in the Chinese world more these days, um, I think it's always been there where there's a relationship between the government and the citizens. Um, I found, being in the university, actually, um, the freedoms are a little different. Students have access to um, Facebook, YouTube, um, at the university. They, they don't have that problem. Um, so far? Well, so far, but that so far has been a long far. <laughs> okay. but, but it's like this, 
it's sort of like this. I look at China like this. The U.S. is a 10-lane freeway. China is a 50-lane freeway. So as long, there's a lot of room to maneuver within the lanes, but you can't touch certain areas. You know, the sensitive topics, of the three T's, Tibet, Tiananmen, and Taiwan, okay? And when something flares up, like the relationship with the U.S.-Taiwan, I think the government becomes more sensitive, you know, how the information is managed. I think what Larry has said has been true for American businesses. There was a change in the cybersecurity law where the uh, government has access into your service. Um, but I think that that's still evolving. A lot of that law is, is evolving. Um, and I think we see the changes. But again, um, what I see being there as an ordinary American citizen, teaching, working there. Uh, well, I, and, and, I, and I'm sorry, is this a change in the past 10 years? This, is, this, is this more restrictive than 10 years ago? I, I, Larry's nodding yes. Honestly, for me, um, I don't see, I don't feel that impact. I know that I'm, a, I'm, I'm there, I know that there is some form of censorship, but I think that what's happening is that as the internet is there, many Chinese see what's going on outside, they have VPNs, and there's a lot more voices being said over the internet. So I think the government is sensitive to that because ordinary citizens will see something and they will get on the internet and they will put comments and so there's an internal security issue that the government uh, is concerned about. But, but Larry is saying that's increased. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It used to be, it used to be very easy to get a free um, a VPN, virtual private network, that allowed you to boycott the, or, or bypass the uh, Great Chinese Firewall. Um, now you have to have a very sophisticated program that you have to load, or if you're traveling in China, mm -hmm. you have to load it in the U.S because uh, you can't download it in, in, in China. Uh, within China, they're, they're trying to uh, uh, stamp out all these little smaller virtual public network uh, things. The universities are a bit of an exception. They, they, they allow some leeway there. Mm, that's but, interesting. But for the general population, uh, uh, no. But they just load their laptop when they're traveling in Europe with, with a VPN, pay the money, and, uh, and, and, and By, do it. Bypass the yeah. restrictions. But, but even when I'm outside the university, I have a VPN, and it works beautifully. I, I've never, ever had anything shut down. The only time where I see in Beijing where it's more sensitive is, for example, the National People Congress convenes. Um, they're worried about some domestic disturbances. That's when I see the VPN clamp down. But it's funny, but um, the Chinese, yes, some of the free VPNs are shut down. But it's amazing because my students find VPNs and they still have access to it off campus. Yeah. And so uh, I don't think you can really root that out, but it's still there. They, there is access. Okay. What's the deal with the foreign direct investment? That, that's something that's changed in the 10 years since we, we collaborated on this article. Why? What, what's happened? I, I, I think what has happened is that um, a lot of U.S. companies first started out 80s and 90s to come in, set up operations in China. Right. And remember at that time, the goods that came in to set up, P&G is one of them, uh, a lot of consumer goods, a lot of lower end things, your uh, briefcases, your clothing, all made in China. Right. Um, they were made in Guangdong in that region. But what, what has happened is that the cost of labor has gone up. Right. So there was a shift that was happening already in play. And the second thing I think Larry has raised a good point is that um, when the emergence of a society that has money, they want nicer things, they want better things. So the business will have to change, uh, you uh, see? Uh, so they want a smartphones, they want, they want everything what they see other people have around the world. And so um, it becomes expensive to manufacture and um, that, and so the Chinese have now put a conscious effort to get rid of the low end things and say that can go to Southeast Asia. But we're Vietnam gonna to Vietnam. Some places like that. That's and it. if for direct investment, for example, Apple hires Foxconn, a Taiwanese company, and they have a huge campus. And on that campus, they have uh, two million workers. 
and they make everything from iPhones for iPhones. They contract things from HP and you know, 20 different companies. They make things there. So they, they, they're trying to do things that are more um, higher end technology. And that, and that follows what, what, what you were saying, Larry, about the economy and, and, yeah. and the lives of the people. So, yeah, so as, as Russell was saying, when U.S. foreign investment was first coming into China, they were, uh, the, the U.S. companies were coming out there sort of outsourcing. Uh, and uh, because they could get projects, make products made a lot cheaper in China, ship them back to the U.S. and sell them. Uh, with the rise of the middle class, now you have a whole middle class that, that can buy these goods. So now American companies have shifted dramatically just in the time that we were living in Shanghai to coming into China to, to develop for China, uh, uh, have plants to sell inside China, I not see. to ship back to the U.S. But related to the high technology stuff, too, is that there's a big concern now for foreign investors uh, to invest in the tech sector because the Chinese want your technology. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of ways they get that uh, legally or illegally. Uh, well, so isn't that what uh, our president is saying to uh, I'd rather not address that. that, that, that that's a far <laughs> more complicated issue. Uh, but, but American business is quite concerned about uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, the, the theft of their technology. In, uh, in, in, in China. But let me just add to that. I think that foreign direct, it doesn't matter if you go to China, if you go to El Salvador, if you go anywhere in the world, or Africa, the developing country wants to take it. And as a business company, you know that's gonna happen. My job as being a lawyer there um, for a number of years is, is uh, drafting and negotiating what technology goes, what stays, um, licensing agreements, uh, timing your technology, so that the technology that goes there, you know, it's old technology, not new technology. Knowing what technology you can't take out the U.S., that's all part of the understanding, and it's part of the business model, because if you're going to set up and sell the retail in China, okay, you will probably lose some of that technology. And we know what reverse that, engineering that's is. That's a known as you go in, that's what you're you telling You know as you go in, and that's the role of the lawyers, yeah. to advise your client and to negotiate, structure it, and you would say, don't set up a joint venture, set up a wholly foreign owned entity because you can control um, your IP, um, license agreements. Um, for example, if you're manufacturing something, I, I'll tell the client, okay, this is what you do. Your sensitive stuff, you bring into Assemble. That's what Apple does at Foxconn. None of the sensitive technology is made there. It's brought in from South Korea okay. or Taiwan. And second of all, is that you would have four different factories and none of the factories knew what the other factories were doing. They would not even know that. So the IP could not go between the different okay. factories. So that tells me that you've learned a lot since you've been in China. And I'd like to, as we close here, I'd like to ask each of you to tell me, what have you learned about life and law from your time in China? <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you, you're <laughs> Dean Emeritus. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what I've learned about life and, and, and law in China, yeah. Um, I, th I think my, my biggest takeaway from China, uh, I, I've, I've been saying good things and I've been saying negative things about China today, and, and I, I do all the time. Uh, there, there's, there's, pluses, there's huge pluses and huge minuses. Uh, but by, by, if you just talk to the, the Chinese people, uh, the Chinese people are, are great people. Uh, they, they, they share many of the same values that we have. Uh, they worry about their kids, the future of their children. Uh, they worry about uh, environmental issues, uh, educational issues, and all of that. Uh, and uh, they're, just, they're just great, great people. People are all the same wherever people, we are, yeah. is what you're telling yeah. me. When you get up to the government level, then it gets more complicated on, on both sides of the, uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean. Okay. Well, I guess, you know, one thing that I've got to say is that I think in the book, I think, the same thought that I have when I first arrived in China. They have this word called kai. Kai means I can do it. you can do anything you want. And it doesn't bother you. They, they, I mean, when I was there 15 years ago. Regardless of what the loss regard, is. Regardless, <laughs> of, regardless, of, regardless of, of the hardships. People. Yeah. Optimism. People. There's just, there's just optimism. People. Human that, quality. That, that, that really still keeps me there because I grow with it. And I'm optimist about the future. Um, and they've experienced many changes, a lot of good, some bad, but however, overall, I think that uh, what they want to be are like citizens like around the world, like in the U.S. They share the same value. 
education, um, medicine, a better life. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate you talking with us after 10 years and ending on an optimistic note, a positive note about people and China. Thank you very much. Looking forward to our next 10 years. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.